Hello, welcome to another episode of the Rifle Chair channel. I am Rifle Chair, this is my channel. Uh, today I want to talk a little bit about the uh, the poor man's hunting rifle and, and basic preparedness. And so when I, when I refer to um, the poor man's hunting rifle, <laughs> it seems to be the hunting rifle that I, that I prefer among, over all others. And that is the the uh, Lee Enfield rifle. In fact, uh, I've been hunting with the Lee Enfield rifle since I was a kid. You know, you know, and maybe it's uh, I've talked about this in previous videos. Maybe some of it is kind of my comfort zone, my knowledge area, or my knowledge, uh, yeah, knowledge group, kind of uh, around hunting rifles and so on. But it's a little bit more than that. Uh, I've tried, you know, the, many of the other types of uh, commonly available hunting rifles out there, and uh, many of them work absolutely just just fine. Um, however, there's there's something about using something that you know very very well. You're very competent with it. You've got the you got the uh, the time in. I mean, for example, a carpenter who's you know, been working for 10 years versus a carpenter that's been working for six months kind of concept, if you know what I mean. Which one are you going to hire? Uh, or the 10-hour threshold when it comes to commercial pilots? You want the competent pilot, not the one who's, you know, missing a few stripes, shall we say. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the poor man's hunting rifle and some basic preparedness stuff. So i got some notes here so I don't get off track. So this here is uh, a Parker Hale. I don't know what version it is. There's the Supreme, there's the Standard, and all of these different kinds of things. Uh, this one here is uh, quite nice. Been using it for a while now, but every year I, I try to take it out and run it through its, its paces. Yeah, it's running a, a vintage Muraku from Japan fixed 4x32 I think it is. Yeah, 4x32. Um, the scope is uh, probably late 60s, mid 70s vintage. It's got a German number one reticle in it, which I adore. I adore the number one reticle, uh, especially for hunting. If you're in low light conditions, it really stands out really quite nicely, com especially compared to open sights. If it's dark, it's dark. But with a with a decent scope, a decent glass, this has actually got pretty good glass in it. Like, there's none of that parallax business around the edges of the image. It's really good. I like it, and I've been using it on infields for years. I did have to replace the gaskets on here. This came on an old a rifle that I obtained from uh, Tradex. These these old hunting rifles that they imported from Sweden. It had this on it. It was on an FN98 Husqvarna an 8x57 Mauser, and so I had to replace the gaskets around the turrets. There's a little, there's a little rubber O-ring there that, that uh, I had a bunch of them that I had bought from my pressure washer, and they just, they work perfectly. Just keep the, keep the rain out of the turrets. Anyhow, so this, uh, this Parker Hale, it was manufactured, at least as the receiver is date stamped in 1943, the barrel is date stamped 1917, uh, the bolt number does not match the receiver, the, the receiver does not match the barrel. I mean, it's a Parker Hale is basically a parts gun, all right, but it works great. I checked the headspace, it's got a good barrel on it, it's not perfect, fairly worn. I mean, two world wars. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to have some mileage on it. But as we'll, I'll show you later here, is that uh, it seems to grip okay. Um, so that's the rifle. And it, here's the thing, though, is I mean, because I run rifles similar to this when I'm hunting, this there has to, this has a tendency to be a little bit of shame involved because you're essentially running the poor man's rifle. I mean, in Canada, it's commonly referred to the poor man's rifle. I still, I don't see as many people running Enfields anymore like I used to, but there is a, a fair amount of shame, especially when when you're at the range. You've got somebody over here with a with a Sacco Finlight. You've got this guy over here with a Winchester Model 70, brand spanking new, you know, uh, you know, fancy scopes, low pulled, you know, five HDs and. Uh, and uh, VX3s, you know, they're fine scopes, and uh, and I would like to have one of those scopes on here. But this is the poor man's rifle. Um, oh, what 
so anyway, you get a little bit of the snobbery at the range, you know, kind of giving you that glance, you know, oh, the guy's got a poor man's rifle. But it is what it is. You know, people are just that way. Uh, but for me, it really comes down to is that I've tried those other calibers, the belted magnums, the, uh, the short magnums, and uh, I started to develop a, a flinching problem with these uber lightweight uh, commercial hunting rifles. And uh, I started to develop a, a flinching problem. And this is shooting off the bench, mind you. Um, just the recoil. I just, I, and when I, and I, I, for me, it was a, a Ruger Mark II. Um, uh, and it was in three three thirty eight Winchester Magnum. It wasn't a particularly lightweight rifle, but holy cow. It was light enough, and uh, I started to develop a, an awful flinch, and it, it took me a few years to actually get out of that situation. Now, I've been in many hunting situations where, uh, you, know, you know, you're stalking an animal, you're reading sign, you're walking, you're, or maybe you're just sitting in your roost waiting for something to stick its head up, and then you hear a gunshot echoing across the valley. I mean, echoing across the valley but they keep shooting they, they're missing it's like, oh my goodness like what did that person do to prepare for his hunting trip now, I, I've also seen I've also seen people at the range getting ready because you know uh, the rifle range is kind of a it's kind of a pain in the ass when fall is approaching because the range is full of hunters and there's not really any space, you know, people take their time and they take forever. And like, I have a system and I get, I get done what I need to get done, but I'm being delayed sometimes by hours because of, I'm having to share the, the line with a whole bunch of other hunters. And you can see these guys, they put their range up or their target up at 25 meters, big, you know, 11 by 17 piece of paper or eight and a half by 11. And if they hit that at 25 meters, they think they're good to go. That's their zero. 25 meters, maybe it's a 200 meter zero. And if they, they get, if they hit the paper, they're happy. And I've seen this over and over again. <laughs> Anyhow, to get back to the point, you know you're not ready. Just because you were able to hit that piece of paper at 25 meters, you are not ready to go hunting. Now they're still using the same ammunition that they've had for 20 years. There's nothing wrong with that. But it tells me is that you haven't been practicing. You haven't been developing your skills and drills. You do your zeroing off a bench and you don't develop your zero in the shooting positions that you would normally use in the field while you're hunting. Find a rest, use a rest, that's fine, but it's not a bench. And rifles behave differently when you're shooting it offhand or maybe you're shooting it in prone or prone supported with your weight behind the rifle you've got some you know you're, you're leaning into it they shoot differently than they do when you're shooting off a bench so there's that the way you zero your rifle is critically important and i and i highly recommend <clears throat> even though you know in ground like this the shots have a tendency to be relatively close you do occasionally need to take a long shot. So even though I quite frequently find myself hunting in ground like this, I still have a 200 meter zero. I still have a 200 meter zero. Now I know that at 100 meters, I'm printing four inches high. That's no problem. I'm still going to put, if it's a broadside shot on a moose, it's still, it's going to go right in the boiler maker where it needs to go. Again, at 200 meters, same thing. I remember calling in a moose, it was around 850 meters away. And he closed the, the, the distance from 850 meters to 200 meters like that. So um, getting yourself in a situation where you can actually find yourself a good stable shooting position that you can, you have a decent um, uh, point of view for, for the area that you're trying to engage that target in. I think it just really comes down to shooting experience. And if, you don't, if you're not practicing those kinds of things, maybe, I mean, you see the way I'm attired. This is kind of like I'm going to go do some shooting here and I'm going to shoot in the manner that I would be attired when I'm in the field hunting just because that's how I roll. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, just and just one last tip when it comes to shooting. It's, it's an ac- acronym that I learned um, from a very special warrant officer in the Canadian military. And it's an acronym that I actually have to roll through in my head every single time that I shoot because it's critically important to be, um, in order to be able to, to shoot consistently. And the way you do it is you run this this through your head. It's called HABIT. The acronym is HABIT. Your hold, alignment, breathing, instinctive position, and trigger. Trigger control, trigger discipline. I'm not going to get into the basics of the fundamentals of marksmanship, but maybe just kind of do a Google search for the acronym HABIT. Hold, alignment, breathing, instinctive position, and trigger discipline. Have a look at that. And then do that every single time you're shooting. So zeroing. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about that. So I'm going to uh, verify the zero on this, but I'm going to do something a little bit different. What I'm going to do is yesterday evening, I filmed it. Now I'll put this in the, the video. Uh, is that I zeroed the rifle. And I got a nice little six, six round group. It's around an inch and a half, maybe... Well, it's a little bit of this, so it's a little bit of uh, horizontal movement in the grouping that I that I shot yesterday. And that's that's me. That's not the rifle. That's just me. But uh, I'm going to shoot this. I'm going to take the scope off, and I'm going to shoot this open sights just to verify where my open sights are. And then uh, I reattach the scope. And what I've got here, if you can see on this rifle here, these are just your. Again, poor man's rifle rings. These are weaver rings. And you can see there's a dot on the dial and a dot on the on the rings. I don't know if you can see that or not. You can see that dot there, dot there. Those are my tension indicators. So I want to try to get as close to returning to zero as I can. And I do that using those uh, tension indicator dots that I put on the scope and the rings, the dials. Very similar to what you would do if you were in the military running a C-79 um, LCAN on your C-7. You would do something like that. So I'll take the scope off. Oops. Got my microphone turned off here, I think. Yep, turned it off. Yep, we won't run a microphone on this. We don't need it anyway, I guess. So I'll just uh, put the scope down. I'll shoot a grouping with open sights just to verify where that is. And then I'll reaffix the scope and see how close to my original zero I am. And I, you know, I've, I've done this, uh, I've done this exercise with uh, the worn uh, quick detach rings, very expensive rings, and I'm able to get back within three minutes of angle of my zero. So if you think about that, at 100 meters is just fine, especially for probably a, a dangerous game animal. You're going to be shooting at something fairly close. But for me, you know, it's. Uh, Three minutes of, of an angle could be could be pretty pretty serious miss if you're at 200 meters. But it's going to verify it and see, see see how close we are. Okay, so here's 100 meter grouping. It's way off to the right, and it's a little bit low, so it means I need a, I need a, uh, a shorter front sight. 
So my point of impact should basically be in the center of this eight inch circle. My point of aim being here. So obviously I can't trust my, my rear sights or my open sights right now unless I, I make a, a fairly dramatic change to it. I gotta drift the front sight over. Um, yeah, I've got a really tall sight on there. I think that's a 0 .075. So it needs to be uh, a shorter front sight. I don't have any, have any of those tools here with me out in the bush, but uh, that's something I can work on, you know, at a later time. At least I know I shouldn't be hunting with my open sights at this point in time. I've checked it, right? That's your due diligence. But, you know, for a 100 meter group, that's not too bad. Okay, let's put this back on. See how, uh, where we land. Why would you want to take your scope off? Well, let's say your, uh, let's say your rifle slips off your, your shoulder and uh, lands off a rock face 30 meters below and your scope is smashed. Does that mean you got to pack in your hunting trip, go home? Well, I suppose it depends. Let's see if I can get this, uh, how close I can get this here. Good. Good and good. Let's do it. That's not good. Okay, let's go check target. So there we are. This is after removing and reapplying the scope. I've actually removed and reapplied the scope twice now since I zeroed last night. Zeroing uh, was a bit of a lateral, a little bit of lateral stringing on last yesterday's or last night's target. A little bit of vertical stringing on this morning's target. 
So if you just kind of average the two out, it comes pretty darn close. Maybe a, maybe an inch to the right. That's basically, you know, that's that's almost uh, one minute of angle variation from taking the, the scope off twice and, and then reapplying it a, a third time. So I think that's pretty good. That's even better than the worn rings. And these are your cheap, cheap, cheap weaver, you know, scope rings. You know, that they, they've been making them since I was a kid and they always seem to work well. They never seem to lose zero. You know, they're they're just cheap, cheap, cheap weaver USA rings, but they, they seem to work. Why why do we need to have all these you know, there's kind of an art to uh, to using these because uh, they have a tendency to want to cam over when you're sh when you're tightening the screws. You just kind of kind of assume that that's going to happen. Just tilt it a little bit to one side before you tighten them down, so it brings it back down to a nice lateral. But I mean, obviously, they hold relatively well. So that's interesting. That's good. This is great. So what do you think? Well, for me, I was up here yesterday, and the, the, the purpose of the exercise was to come up to the cabin and sweep the chimney and uh, get it nice and hot, you know, make sure everything was working good because winter's coming, falls, there's going to be frost in the ground before you know it. I want to make sure it works and it's safe. You were get re remove all those tar deposits and so on. So I did that. Ran the stove last night, got the kind of musty smell out of the cabin, aired out all the sleeping bags, just in preparation, you know, because, you know, I'd, honestly, I'm unlikely to go hunting this year. Unlikely to happen for me. I got too many things on the go. Even though I got time booked off for it, I'm probably going to end up using stuff for that, that for like urgent issues that I'm trying to address, like building a house, but, uh, if the opportunity does arrive and a window of opportunity arises, I'm going to be ready for it. And you don't just pick up a rifle and go unless you've uh, run it through a few trials and tests. Just like you don't expect to live in a cabin if you're worried that the uh, the chimney might catch fire. That's how we, we avoid problems in the field. Prior planning prevents piss poor performance. And so when you hear echoing shots, <laughs> echoing across the valley, because a hunter isn't ready, and they've, they've seen an animal, either the animal is going to be full of holes, you're going to be, you know, you're going to lose a lot of meat, bloodshot, and just gross. Or you're wounding it and it's going to run off and die in the bush. And what a huge waste. Here's the thing, guys, is that everything is getting more expensive. Gas, ammunition, rifles, optics, uh, uh, game tags, your license. You start adding all of these costs up. I mean, it's a to go hunting is a horrifically expensive uh, proposal for a lot of people. Especially when you're going to drive a long ways and it's going to cost you $300 just to fill your truck up with diesel. You don't want to, you don't want to be doing that. Just from a financial perspective, it just doesn't make any sense. So get yourself ready and, and get yourself prepared. Run some handling drills. Become familiar with your rifle. There's a, there's a number of people that I won't go hunting with. I just won't. Um, they're not good shots. They haven't put the time in. They're not interested. They just want to go hunting. And okay, I guess I, I guess I can kind of understand that. Um, it's not that they absolutely need the meat. They're doing well, not well off enough for the way it is. But at least put the time in, so you're not you're not wasting meat or avoidably wounding an animal. That to me is just terrible. And uh, maybe a character fly even. So get yourself ready. And also from a safety perspective, uh, if you see the person that you're hunting with does not have good muzzle control, they're not really safe with their firearm, maybe they've had a negligent, neg negligent discharge, out. That's it. Game over. 
I'm not hunting with you if that's if that's how you're going to come to the uh, to the situation. I may be, I, I might be in harm's way hunting with that person. I'm not going to do it. So those are all kind of little judgment calls and so on. Practice your handling drills. Get your safety down. Um, get your chores done. And also one, one last thing is that uh, whatever ammunition that you use to get yourself zeroed. Use the same ammunition when you're hunting. Use the same ammunition. Use the same ammunition lot if you can. If you're going to go buy factory ammunition, go buy, make sure you check the, the lot numbers on the factory ammo. Make sure all three of those boxes of ammunition, your, your 60 rounds, whatever it is, it's all got the same lot number. So when you're zeroing, you're using the same ammunition when you're hunting. Because different lot numbers um, can shoot differently in your rifle. You know, just don't shoot with that brand and, and go hunting with a totally different brand or a totally different bullet weight. Just common sense, you guys. I don't want to come off like I'm all critical and, and all that kind of stuff. I'm just, uh, you know, drawing on my own personal experiences that, you know, I, those are situations to be avoided and maybe even people to avoid hunting with. So uh, that's it for me. Hunting season is upon us. And uh, good luck. Cheers. Maple leaf. Thank mm -hmm. you.